Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the fourth edition of the Beef Productivity from Grassland series of webinars that we're holding on behalf of EIT Food, who's funding this. I'd like to welcome tonight, we're going to be doing Putting Theory into Practice, Accelerating Our Journey to Carbon Neutrality. And we've got one exciting speaker tonight. We've got Dr. John Gilliland, uh, Director of Global Agriculture at Devonish, is our guest speaker. And John is a former president of the Ulster Farmers Union and has a unique breadth of experience in the world of farming, food and the environment. And we will also hear from our two exciting um, ambassador farmers, James Evans from Shropshire and Sam Chelsney in Northern Ireland. And they're going to give their bit of their thoughts on what they're doing on farms to reduce their carbon impact. Okay, so just quickly, very top line, the focus on farmers. This is our ABP is working with all the various companies at the bottom. John Deere, AIA, AgriSearch, Reading, Queen's University, and Hockenheim and Turin University. And we're trying to drive technology and best practice on farm to adapt to the current changes that are happening with the current climate within agriculture. And we're using, obviously, Sam and James as our farmers champions to, to lead that and try and demonstrate the best practice on farm. So without further ado, you don't want to hear from me, you want to hear from these guest speakers. So I'd like to hand over to Sam, Sam Chesney, farmer in Northern Ireland. He's going to talk a bit about what he's doing to try and reduce his carbon impact on his farm. Okay, thank you very much, James, and welcome everybody to this very exciting webinar this evening. It's probably the hottest ticket around at present. Net zero carbon is everywhere. I see the Farmers Weekly have dedicated three pages this week to it. So everybody's talking about it. It's very important that we embrace it. It's, you know, future support coming down the line will depend on how we probably look at carbon, uh, how we store it, how we measure it, and how we can actually reduce it. So what are we doing on this farm? As I've talked in previous weeks, we are a very intensive beef farm, but we're trying to mitigate some of our intensive physicality. We've been villainized, uh, farmers have been villainized by many about the amount of carbon we produce, but we do produce carbon, but we're also the only part of the solution for saving the rest of us. What we're using here, we're only using bulls, and a, there's a, a slide there, one of the bulls we're using, with high genetic merit, greater carcass growth, easier calving, less days of slaughter, so therefore we're using less carbon. Uh, net fit efficiency, we're using bulls that eat, uh, uh, or eat cattle that eat an um, amount of food, but they're, they're doing more on less. Again, we're, we're, we're saving on nutrients and saving on uh, um, days to slaughter. So it's very, very important. We're also using a complete vaccination policy for all our cattle. So again, we're not having unhealthy cattle doing thriving much quicker, less days to slaughter, um, less food, less um, money put into drugs and um, anthelmintics and things like that there. Yeah, we're using more homegrown feed source. We have uh, another week, you've heard of it, growing our mixed species sword increasing the car carbon capture of our um, grassland. We're growing more grass, so therefore we're sequestrating more carbon. Um, we're using more direct seeding methods where we're less plowing, so we're not releasing vast amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, and we're growing um, lots of clover, which means we're using less protein in our concentrates, body and concentrates. Our red clover silage has reduced our concentrate our protein levels in our finishing diets by 3%. So 3% that six pound a ton, that's a uh, percent that's 18 pound a ton. So we're saving there, but we're also uh, improving the amount of carbon and soil structure we have. So uh, one of the most important things that we'll hear, and Dr. John Galena will go into this, I, I would say in great depth, is the amount of hedges and the trees we have on our farm. We are trying to increase the size of our hedges, the, he the height and the width, and therefore we're only really trimming hedges every second or third year. We're trying to increase the, the width and the height of our hedges. And not also does that help sequestrate carbon, it also actually improves the environment for the stock. We believe that on a bad day or a very, very sunny day, stock will eat a half percent to three quarter percent less than they should be eating. Therefore, they're not thriving. So again, with the shelter of these hedgerows and the trees we have on our hedgerows, they will be thriving much better. Again, providing us with a, a, a better product going to, you know, going to finish earlier. But it's very, very important that we have the trees and the hedges and the grassland to stick as much carbon. The shape, the hills, the green 
green areas in Northern Ireland have been shaped by, by farmers over the years. And it's very important that, um, that, that we do look after them. We are custodians of the countryside and we will, will, will of course, to generations to come, we will prove that, that farmers and landowners can manage the country to improve the environment. And as I said, we're all looking forward to hearing John. John's coming up next to tell us what more we can do. He'll probably he'll delve into the history of the, of the land of Dow. And uh, I'll be very, very interested to hear what he has to say. So really, I'm going to wind myself up here now because um, John will have a lot more to say than we have. Thank you very much. I'd now like to hand over to Dr. Jim, John Gilliland. And John will now speak on the pioneer, pioneering work on developing a net farm carbon balance sheet at Dow the State. Thank you very much, James. And can I just thank uh, EIT Food and all the sponsors for asking me to, to come and, and share our journey that um, we, we are on, and we've been on really since 2013. Um, for us, we really see uh, the challenge that the whole industry has been on, but particularly ruminant agriculture is coming in many directions. And, I've just taken four sound bites here. And really, we saw the recognition. We saw this coming back in 2013 when we bought the farm and dug, but we just didn't see it coming from such a breadth. On the left hand, top left hand corner there, you can see the headlines created by the Eat Lancet report human diet causing catastrophic damage to the planet. In more recent times, even in the last month, Tyson, the largest producer of animal protein in the world, they have come out clearly looking to tag on to sustainable production practices and what that will do to help reposition our business. An area that probably uh, an area we didn't see coming from Henry Paulson, the former U.S. Treasury Secretary, he has come out. He, he uh, is chair of the uh, of the Paulson Institute, and has clearly flagged up that actually. Uh, we need to recognize this asset of healthy soils and pollinators. And actually the financial world needs to buy in and needs to put a value on this and reward um, us as custodians of the landscape for the things we do over, over just putting food on the table. Earlier on this year in February time, several of us had the privilege of listening to Arthur Rungsker from the DG Climate Change uh, when he came to Dublin. And he was very clear is there's a new game in town and that actually farmers should not shy away or be threatened by it. But actually he saw that agriculture and particularly farmers had a huge role to play, not just feeding a potential global population of 9 billion, but actually helping the global population on our climate challenge. And he made a clear indication that the European Commission would be looking to support farmers who delivered positive change on carbon. So really what happened in Devnish, Devnish foresaw this journey that was going on and they decided to really put their money where their mouth is and they went out and they bought a farm of land in County Meath, just north of Dublin, back in 2013. I was approached and I was asked to create a journey for Dice that would make it really relevant to the industry. And really what we decided to do is that there are many research organizations who are way ahead of us in focusing on the animal of the ruminant. And we decided, well, not only would we look at the animal, but we'd look at the landscape to which the ruminant sits within. Because sadly, when you look at what is being portrayed in the media, what is being portrayed is our gross emissions, but not our net emissions. And really what we wanted to do is actually put some really hard data supported by some very good scientific institutes and actually start to populate the public narrative with science and facts and not full of conspiracy and theory. And so we bought the lands of Douth in 2013, late 2013. And really since then, we've been doing a collection of things from delivering a soil improvement program transforming bent soils under grassland into something that's truly dynamic. And we've seen the over trebling of our soil biology in that period. We've been measuring carbon sequestration, not only in our soils, but above ground in our trees and hedges. We've been also looking at the other public goods that we do as farmers, looking at how we improve water quality. We 
uh, two miles of the River Boyne along our waterfront. And certainly if we put slurry on the wrong time of year, of course we're going to have an impact. So we wanted to get an understanding of how does our nutrient and soil leave our farm and cause problems in water quality. But we also want to get our head around biodiversity and we have an extra challenge and that is we host one of the last lowland herds of wild red deer in Ireland. And much that they are Ireland's top mammal, they also are devour our woods and hedges. And at the moment, I want to capitalize on carbon sequestration of trees and hedges. So I have a huge challenge there in the environment. And if that wasn't complicated enough, it just so happens we are 25% of our UNESCO World Heritage Site for Bruna Bonia. And uh, if I want to break the sods, uh, I need to get a license for the National Monument Service. So an interesting farm to manage, but I want to share with you our journey, really about how we're creating this ruminant performance landscape house and answer the question, is ruminant agriculture a pariah? Which the majority of the global media seems to think it is. Or is it a global asset, an asset that can eat poor quality roughage and turn it into highly nutritious meat and milk? And no, I'm biased, let's call a spade a spade. We tend to the latter, many times to the former. So we wanted to put the evidence around it. So really what, if you're going to do a journey like this and you're going to make change, it's really helpful if you start in day one and you actually go out and bench line your, your performance right at the start. So in 2014, we commissioned three totally different digital surveys to benchmark what we were doing in the landscape. The helicopter on the left hand side, mounted on the two tripods on either side, are, are what they call laser scanners or LIDAR scanners that sends a laser beam down to the ground and it records the speed that it comes back up. This was technology de developed by the US military and it gives you a total three-dimensional impact or, or, or picture of the landscape. And I'll show you one or two of, what, of the results of that. The middle one was to help us with the archaeology. It is a geological, a geophysics rig, and it tells you what's under the soil in the top meter. Very important for us because in a World Heritage site, we, we started with eight national monuments. We've now got 13, and we seem to, seem to breed them as well as Sam does in some of his breeding programs in County Down. And the third thing we did is we did a detailed GPS precision soil sampling analysis, really getting an understanding of our, of our soil fertility. All of them done on a GPS digital framework so we could overlay one another. And these two images, just for the people who've never seen the output of LIDAR, and we call it new to agriculture technology. Been around for 20 years when the US military designed it for jungle warfare. Now what you can see on the image on the left hand side is our farm dose naked. All the LIDAR, what we've done is we digitally erased every blade of grass, every tree, every hedge. And so you can see the complete landscape. You can see right in the middle of it, a huge big clay bank hedge, see our archeology. span on the right hand side is a blow up around this, the, the enlargement around the house and some of the fields on either side of the house. And you can see every ditch, every wall, every hollow, you can see it and it's an extraordinary piece of technology. It helped us with our archaeology, but boys did it help us also with measuring our carbon and our overland flow. We also benchmarked our soils and we inherited a farm of lovely brown earth mineral soils but the previous owner had raked the farm for 40 years. They had taken one crop of hay off it a year and done nothing else. They never cleared fallen trees, they never fixed fences, they never put lime on it. And so you can see our average pH in February 2014, 5.5, with us an optimal of 6.5, so really behind the curve. Potash was just borderline and phosphate on the whole was really low as well, bar a couple of hot spots there. But at least that was the start of our baseline. The next thing we wanted to do is we baselined our you know, pH, our P and K. We then wanted to baseline our soil carbon because if, you're, if you really want to go on this carbon journey, it's, you, know, you, you can talk about annual increments, but actually if you're going to create a balance sheet, you actually need to go out and count what you've got already. And that actually, that process was quite a revolution to us. So what we did on our farm, 
is we went out and the International Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, they have a protocol on how you measure soil carbon. And if you want it, you want your results to be recognized by them, you must measure, take a sample in the top 30 centimeters and not in the top seven and a half or 10 centimeters, which is more customary. So it's, it's a bit more of a hassle. So we went out and we dug 88 soil pits, geographically spread across the whole of the farm, and also taking in different land uses, a bit of woodland under these hedges, uh, across the grass swords, and we got an analysis of our soil carbon. What we weren't expecting to see, and bear in mind our farm has never been ploughed for 40 years, some of it has never been ploughed at all, I said it's a mineral brown earth soil, from analysis of other brown earth soils in good condition, we would have expected our soil carbon to be between 4 and 5 percent. Ours actually had an average of 2.1 percent, which is atrocious. And we had no understanding of it. And it absolutely burst the myth that I believe that the IPCC's Carbon Sequestration Committee have said that soils on the long-term grass, and their definition of long-term grass is 20 years or longer, that soil carbon plateaus and you can put no more into it. Well, here we were managing a farm that had not been ploughed for 40 years and our soil carbon was nowhere near its upper limit and clearly said there were other things that were going on. And in our case, we suspect it was to do with our atrociously low pH. And I'll come back and talk about that later. The other thing we then did when I, um, is we went out and we measured the carbon in the trees and hedges. So you could see the helicopter and the LIDAR technology again. But this time we used a different piece of software. And what this piece of software can do is it actually can create a 3D model of every tree and hedge on the farm. And it also took a detailed aerial photographic survey at the same time. So when Stuart Green of Chagas and his colleagues analyzed our data, they were able to see what trees were there. They were able to work out bulk densities. And the table there, that orange or brown table you see in front of you, talks about the biomass density tons of carbon per hectare. And what you can see in our woodlands, we've got 83 tons of carbon per hectare. But interesting, our hedges, we've got 50% more at 127. And that stands to sense. You can go for a walk through a woodland. You'll not go for a walk through the middle of a hedge because a hedge is far more dense. The downside of a hedge is, is you need an awful lot of ribbons of hedges to get a hectare of woodlands. So it's, it's a bit of a toss up, but it really shows how valuable hedges were. So that, we were the first farm anywhere in the world to, to actually audit it. There were, um, the Environment Protection Agency in the Republic of Ireland came out at the same time with a document about how you would measure hedges using LIDAR. And we're grateful to Stuart Green and Chagas for helping us uh, on that. When we did, we're doing that too, because although the pressure on us at the moment is around carbon and sometimes water quality, sometimes ammonia, we also did a, a, you know, an ecological survey too, because you know, you're better to baseline the lot, and as the land manager and the farmer on there, I'm responsible for everything, and I need to be able to answer that. So we did a complete ecological baseline, uh, completing it in 2019. In our case, we've got special recognition for kingfisher, lamb, salmon, lamprey and otter, because of the two miles of riverfront we have with the river boy. We really wanted to crack our journey towards net carbon zero. So what we were able to do is get our head around in a, in a farmed landscape, greenhouse gases you know, escape, but they also get sequestered. And currently, our industry is reported on what they call gross emissions. In other words, they measure the amount of nitrous oxide that comes out of our soils, the measured amount of methane that comes from our animals and from manures. They measured the amount of carbon dioxide that comes from heating buildings or diesel and engines or whatever else. But what they don't measure is what trees, hedges, grass sequester. And so we decided we were going to create a whole farm annual carbon balance sheet and to see where were we on that journey in carbon neutrality as such. So from our baselines, uh, which I showed you on our soils and our hedges, and then we went and did a literary review, looked at peer-reviewed publications to work out what were the best annual carbon sequestration assumptions to use. 
We're indebted, a lot of these actually came out of the work that AFPI have done in Hillsborough. They have the longest term soil trials under grass on the island of Ireland, 50 years in their slurry trials. And they were able to give us a really good understanding of prudent annual carbon sequestration rate, which we put in. Because our idea is to go back and measure our soils every five years and our hedges every five years. But you have to make an assumption on your annual increment in between. And then when you go back and measure in five years time, you'll be able to check, have the assumptions been right? So you can see in our farm, we've broken into grazing ground, our woodlands, our floodplains, our hedgerows. And you can see uh, along the horizontal middle bit there, total soil sequestration per year, 128 tonnes. Total tree sequestration per year, 54 tonnes. So in Douth, we are sequestering annually roughly 180 tonnes of carbon. Now it's important on this journey that we don't confuse carbon with carbon dioxide or its equivalents. So you actually have to multiply your carbon figure by 3.66. So the 665 figure comes from 181 times 3.66 gives you 665 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. And that's what you use in your calculators. That's what emissions are measured on. So we need to make sure we're comparing apples with apples, apples with apples, not apples with oranges. The next thing I wanted to do then to say, well, one key variable I could do now is adjust my stocking rate. So can I put some sensitivity around different stocking rates? And at the end of the day, I have given a commitment to Devnish that by 2025, we will deliver carbon neutral beef and lamb. And I want to understand how much more of a journey I need to do in the next five years. So don't run away on this slide, but let me walk you through this slide. What I've done here is I have sensitized our net farm emissions to different stocking rates, understanding that we sequester 665 tons. So along the x-axis here, I've got stocking density. So on the left-hand side, you'll see one, and then you'll come across the x-axis, you'll see two, and right over on the right-hand side, you'll see two and a half. So that's livestock units per hectare. Up the y-axis, you've got greenhouse gas emissions in tons per year. And this is for the whole farm business. This isn't per animal or per hectare, it's for the whole farm. So if I take you to one livestock unit per hectare, at one livestock unit you know, per hectare, we can graze 91 livestock units, cow-calf equipments. And they are grossing 580 tons in total of greenhouse gases. But I said in my last slide, we're sequestering 665. So if you take 665 away from 580, you get a minus 76. In other words, in Douth today, if we had one livestock unit per hectare, we would already be beyond carbon neutral today. And in fact, we'd be carbon negative at minus 76. If I then take you to the right-hand side of the bar chart, at two and a half livestock units per hectare, so that would be like a derogated farm in an NBZ, what you will see there is we can have 228 animals, that can gross 1,450 tons of emissions. But then I can take my 665 tons of sequestration away from that. And in that case, my net position is I would be producing 795 tons and not the 1,450 that I would be reported against. In Douth, we don't want to be a derogated farm. We're happy to pitch at two livestock units per hectare, so just underneath the derogation. And in that case, we can have 182 animals grossing 1,160 tons of greenhouse gases. But again, we can take our sequestration off that, taking us down to 500 tons. So currently at the moment with our suckler cow and calf system we've got there, we are displacing 56% of all our greenhouse gas emissions today. Now the irony of what you're looking at there, currently the industry is reported on on the top of the blue bar, okay? We're reported on on the gross emissions. We are not reported on the net emissions, which is that red line that you see going diagonally across. And the thing we must succeed in doing in the industry is getting the industry 
reported on net emissions and not gross emissions. And only then will we start to get recognition for the positives that we do. Now, going beyond that, I said to you, I have given a commitment that we will deliver carbon neutral beef and lamb by 2025. Now, I could do that today. The easiest way I could do that today is have less animals that die. And there are many environmental uh, passionate people who would love me to do that. And so in Dow today, we could be carbon neutral at 1.25 livestock units per hectare today. But you know something? That doesn't feed 9 billion people. And that's part of the challenge we have to deliver. So we're a livestock innovation company. So what we're looking at is how do I keep two livestock units per hectare, but do other mitigation to actually reduce our net emissions down to zero and hopefully go beyond. So I want to share some of those. And at the moment, I'm looking at the landscape measures rather than the animals. Sam focused on the animals. I'm looking at the landscape measures. And when you do the both together, you accelerate your pathway. And so the first thing we did is improve our soil pH because there's a very close relationship in a mineral soil of soil pH to soil carbon. And your soil carbon sits within the soil biology and the more optimal your pH is, the more your soil biology churns, the more carbon you lock in it. And so really, over the last six years, the key focus we've been is get way out of this average pH of 5.5 and get it up over 6.6. .6. So we do soil sampling analysis every two years. We use GPS, we always go back to the same place. And so you can see the consequence of our Lyme applications there. And you can see uh, the change in our, in our soil pH. And we're fairly comfortable that when we go back uh, in 2023 and measure our soil carbon, we will see a corresponding improvement just by soil pH alone. The second thing we've done, and I listened to a very good lecture two weeks ago, was ar around uh, using multi-species wards. So we too have looked at multi-species wards. We have devoted 36 hectares of the farm to full-grown cattle and sheep trials. And we are trying four different swards. So our old heritage sward, straight ryegrass, a six-way mix, including two, you know, two grasses, two herbs, two legumes, and a 12-way mix of three grasses, four legumes, and five herbs. Uh, we have five PhD students funded by the Marie Curie program um, uh, in Brussels. And we're doing this with Bagram University, with UCD, and supported by Board B and the University of Gloucestershire. And really what we're trying to do is put the hard evidence around it. So we're measuring soil carbon, the change in soil carbon. We're looking at then herbage production, mineral content of that. We're then looking at animal performance. And also then when we slaughter the animals, the animals have finished off the multi-species sword. We're looking at micronutrient analysis of the meat to see are we getting a difference in the meat quality of different herbages. The next project we're doing is we're also going to introduce on about 10% of our acreage, and we're going to put trees and animals together. Uh, some people call it agroforestry, some people call it silver pasture. I'm just going to make a clarification between the two. Agroforestry is where you have trees and animals together, but you manage the project to sell good quality timber. Silver pasture is where you put trees and animals together and you manage it to optimize your grass utilization. So you're going in every 10 or 12 years and managing the trees so that you have no shading effect, so you can always drive your grass utilization. So we're looking at silver pasture, that's our interest. And we've been greatly helped by AFBI and by Jim McAdam and AFBI and Lock Goal because they have the longest trials in Europe sitting there, 30 years with ash. And what the first thing you can see, that blue table in the middle, is you look at tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. Silver pasture is between doubling and trebling the annual carbon sequestration per hectare compared to straight grass, which is quite extraordinary. Okay, it's not the same as Sitka spruce, but you know something in Sitka spruce, you can't produce food. Silver pasture, you can. The second thing is if, uh, and we are being asked to deliver on biodiversity. If you look at spiders, you look at birds, you look at beetles. 
In all of those cases over 30 years, ash, agroforestry, or silver pasture has surpassed grassland and woodland. But probably the most interesting thing for me as a practicing farmer, it is also helping on those heavier, damper soils to make our soils more trafficable. Because the key thing for us in making money is that actually a kilo for, of beef from grazed grass is far cheaper than a kilo of beef from ensile grass, which is far cheaper than a kilo of beef from concentrate. So what we're trying to do is drive grass utilization and being able to improve soil trafficability on parts of our farm. And even, I mean, we've just had an awful wet August. Certainly around me at home, there are many animals that had to come in during August time. If you've got 10% of your acreage in silver pasture, instead of bringing them in, throw them onto the silver pasture. It will allow you trafficability in those extreme wet events or early in the spring or late in, in the autumn. So a fantastic tool to help you extend the grazing season, drive your utilization, but drive carbon sequestration and biodiversity. I put this one slide in because I want to focus on the animal a moment. So the last three slides have been focusing on what we're doing on the landscape. And I am very optimistic. By 2030, ruminant agriculture will have proved all the doubters wrong. We can deliver carbon neutrality, not only what we can do in the landscape, but also what we can do with the animals. This slide here I have borrowed from my colleagues in Australia. NLMP stands for the National Livestock Mitigation uh, Program. It was a research program. And really what they've been looking at in Australia is they've been evaluating all the different ways you can reduce methane from the animal. And you'll see down on the left-hand side, the little yellow circle, genetics dairy. If you come horizontally across, you will see a blue circle saying genetics beef and sheep. And we know if you improve genetics, you will drive down the greenhouse gas footprint per kilo of product. We know that. Then you've got, you know, there was a team in New Zealand for a while working in vaccinations and uh, looked at that. There's some people looking at charcoal, others are looking at bioactives like garlic, like citrus. And clearly they do have some ability to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. For me, um, the two that are probably looking at the most promising NOP, more now commonly known as 3NOP, that is a synthetic product uh, manufactured, created by uh, DSM in the Netherlands, and they are bringing it forward to the marketplace as a feed additive where you can reduce methane emissions by 35%. The other one, that uh, the one at the very top there, which is algae, reed seaweed, you will have seen in the media over the last 6-12 months, a lot of interest in red seaweed, asparagopsis, and certainly the work that's been led in Australia by CSIRO, CSIRO, they are seeing, and by UC Davis in California, they're seeing anywhere between 60 and 90% reduction of methane with a half percent feed added, a uh, half percent inclusion on a dry weight basis into a diet. So I absolutely believe we will have the capability. The toolbox will allow us to deliver. The issue is can we get the economics to stack up? It's also important on our farm and all our farms is we don't just deliver on carbon. This particular colorful slide is to, again taken from the analysis of our LIDAR, but using it for a third way. Each of those red, what looks like blood vessels there, those are actually roots of overland flow of excessive rainfall. And it is those roots that will carry any phosphate that escapes from our farm into the River Boyne will go down one of those roots. So what this is telling me is where it will run and also the size of area it drains down. So if you have a two inch rainfall event over six hours, we can predict how much water is going to discharge, where it's going to discharge. So if I'm going to do a riparian strip, I know exactly where to put it and what size it needs to be. And it really, we believe, is another excellent tool to really help us drive down our environmental footprint. When you're on this journey, it is vital that the journey is internationally recognized. It's great to, to, to raise a pint in a bar, uh, in a pub, and say, this is what I've done. But you know something, it's not worth anything unless we actually have it validated by international organizations. Now, we are very fortunate in Ireland, in, in Great Britain, we have some fantastic research facilities, and we have good relationships with Queen's University, with Chagas, with UCD, 
We've got great relationships at SRUC with Harbour Adams, but we also have great relationships with Wageningen University and Research in the Netherlands, who are the world's number one university. And in fact, Douth is one of 11 international lighthouse farms, farms that have gone beyond best practice on five continents. And it's a pleasure to work with them. And they've brought real credibility to our journey. So when we're sitting down with regulators, with policymakers, with environmental NGOs, when we produce the data and it's been validated by one of these key organizations, we bring credibility. Our narrative has value. And therefore, we can start to get proper value for the carbon we're sequestering. The one thing that has, should not have come as a surprise to me when we went on this journey is that there were, would be banana skins out there. And not all the banana skins are of us and the industries making. This particular slide I'm putting up here, the reason I put it in here, it is a snapshot of the World Wildlife Fund for Nature's website on the 28th of April 2017. They announced to the world that they had secured carbon credits for 480,000 hectares of rainforest in the Congo using LIDAR funded by the German government. Now, the reason I'm making a big deal about that is currently in the developing world, measuring above ground carbon using LIDAR is not recognized by IPCC. But it is recognized in the developing world under a thing called RED+. Plus. And it's a real perversion of policy. Either science work or it doesn't work. And quite clearly it does work. WWF would not be doing this. Germany wouldn't be funding it. IPCC would not be recognizing it if the science didn't work. So if the science is good enough for the developing world, surely it's good enough for the developed world too. And we've got some hurdles there that are not of our making and we need to burst through them and we need to have our industry unshackled and to use all the tools. So you do come across these perverseness within policy and within regulation. So I really just want to finish sharing our journey here. We believe we're putting theory into practice. We have absolutely accelerated our journey to carbon neutrality. And my own job's on the line. I've made it very clear that um, we are passionate in delivering carbon neutral beef and lamb by 2020. The key thing for us, we could not have done it without education and training, without the use of technology to create these robust baselines where we can measure what they call natural capital. And by personalizing it, it has absolutely empowered us to make a positive improvement in our practice. And we think that's fundamental. If we want farmers to come on this journey, personalize the issue, give them a target, and they'll work to it. The other thing is we need to measure on a regular basis, but we need to use international protocols to measure. It's not good enough in soil carbon to measure at seven and a half inches, seven and a half centimeters. If the protocol is 30 centimeters, then we're going to have to go to 30 centimeters. And we need to report and verify that change. That brings credibility, it brings transparency, but it also means that we can get the full value of carbon when carbon is properly priced for farmers. That will bring real change, but in my opinion, will also bring significant future profits for hard-pressed livestock producers as we go into, you know, into uh, up, to 20, 20, uh, up to 2030 to hit the targets for 2030. So I hope that has been helpful and certainly I'm staying online and happy to take questions and answers. Thank you. So John from Connor Colgan, Dr. Gillen, what measurements did you use to quantify a trebling in soil biology? I'm going to swell Mr. Scullin's hat, I have to say, is that we actually use one of his PhD students to come down and actually because all our treatments are uh, we've got controls on it. So we still have as a control our old heritage sword, and then we've got our multi-species. So uh, when his PhD student was down about four weeks ago, we did, a, I think it's a mustard test to bring the soil biology to the surface, and then we did a count. And it's quite extraordinary how our multi-species swords have transformed uh, our soil biology just in the year that they have, that they have been in. And it's been uh, really enlightened us. So one of the five PhD students we have resident, that is part of what their PhD is about. And we've baselined it, and we'll baseline it again at the end of the project, along with them, the soil carbon, uh, the soil carbon journey. Because we believe under different sward diversities, you will sequester carbon at different rates. And we want to try and get a feel 
for what is it for you know straight ryegrass or ryegrass clover or six-way mix and get a, feel, a real feel for it. It's really interesting. Like uh, um, we had a farm visit today and you know, seeing when you go with a spade and taking up a sod and looking at the length of the chicory roots, for example, they're going down nearly a meter. And it's extraordinary just seeing the root mass you have under the multi-species vis-a-vis what you have under the straight perennial ryegrass. And a last question before we head into James. Again, for, for John, how far off being paid for our carbon sequestration are we? I think the sooner we can crack how we measure it, the sooner we will get payments for it. There are already voluntary schemes in parts of Europe. Austria has a scheme. The United States have a scheme. But most of the carbon prices of those farms are getting are heavily discounted. They're like five euro a tonne instead of 30 euro a tonne. And they're being discounted because the validation methodology isn't good enough yet. So we've spent a lot of time trying to get our heads around the validation methodology so that when certainly in Britain or Ireland we get a value for a, our carbon, I don't want our carbon price discounted. The, the one thing for certain is we will make sure we have all the belts and braces on, our methodology is good, that we can maximize the return of carbon directly to the farmer or the land manager. Quickly heading into, into James. So James is going to give a quick update on reducing his carbon footprint on his farm and what he's doing. Hey, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I think I'll be quick. I think we're, we're quite short on time. But yeah, what I wanted to do really was just give a bit of a, a personal account about my experience with carbon. You know, why I bothered with it really. As a farmer, what does it mean to me? And, and it's probably kind of accidental how I sort of became interested in it. And a lot of it was on the back of the basically the bad publicity that, that farming, that cattle farming especially was doing and how we were ruining the planet and, and everything like that. And, you know, it really bloody annoyed me to think that, you know, we, we turned organic a few years ago and, and you know, we, we like to think we do things the right way. We're pretty extensive with a lot of hill ground. We're not using any fertiliser. We work, you know, quite hard to increase the organic matter and everything like that. You know, we're out wintering cattle. We're improving the efficiency of cattle all the time, trying to get better daily live weight gains, more cows and calf. You know, all these things, just trying to increase our efficiency. And it made me realize that, you know, we, we as an industry, we weren't very well armed to defend these people. And I had to go down to London to address um, a load of universities who were trying to ban beef off their campuses, you know, 12, 18 months ago. And, you know, I, I just felt that I needed a bit, a little bit more sort of armor to, to, to fight against them. So we ended up doing a carbon audit on farms. Yes, we used a, a carbon calculator, which just basically took into account, we just filled it in our, ourselves. I wouldn't say it is 100% accurate, but it's given us a guide. And, you know, it just, it just showed us we put in our diesel usage, we put in all sorts, how many cattle, how the area, everything like that. And it, and it just basically showed us what, what emissions we were producing, what we were sequestering and what the carbon balance was. And it was quite interesting, really. You know, a lot of it was probably out of my control. We're, we're quite fortunate in the sense that we've got a huge acreage of, of woodland and, and a lot of hedgerows on the farm, which obviously benefited us. So, you know, it put us in a, in a pretty good place, really. So, yeah, that, that just shows here, really, what, what we put in, the inventory, the crops we grow, the amount of livestock, woodland, everything like that. And that just went into our, our total carbon balance, really. I won't bore people with a with the uh, figures too much because obviously they can look again this online and time is pretty tight. So that just shows really, you know, what what are our big emitters were. And obviously that's the livestock, the hedgerows are sequestering quite a bit, the soil, obviously the woodland, it plays a huge, huge amount into it. Of course, every farm is different. You know, we, we've said all, all along, my farm is different to Sam's and every single farm is unique. So you can only work with what you've got. I'm just quite fortunate that we, we've got this woodland to, to sequester all this carbon against. As, as a farmer, really, do we need to be farming carbon? What does it mean to our bottom line? And what I see it now is, is yes, it's a, it's a great tool for fighting climate change. But also, as, as a beef farmer, it's probably one of our best marketing tools that we've got. You know, if, if we can say that we're producing beef that's, that's carbon neutral, as near down to it as possible, you know, this is what the, the supermarkets should be buying into, what, 
you know, I, I definitely know we sell a lot of beef so, through different ways, through butchers and online and things like that. And, you know, the general public are definitely changing. If they're going to eat beef, they want to have it produced in a sustainable manner. And I, and I think going forward, this is, this is critical to our industry. So that's all the slides. But yeah, what, what I'm basically getting at, that we, we proved through that, really, that for every kilo of beef that we're selling dead weight, we're actually sequestering 18 kilos of carbon. You know, and I can't say 100% that that's accurate. And we haven't gone around the whole farm um, measuring at 30 centimeters, you know, like, like John suggested. And that's, that's something that I'd love to get funding for in the future. And I think our new ELM scheme in the future will actually incentivize the way we farm carbon and just the, the benefits it can give us so better wintering and everything like that really but I'll, I'll probably wrap up for now and if anyone's got any questions about what i've talked about please fire away right i'm going to ask a few questions now please the people that are answering the questions can we be sort of quite brief on the on on, on the response because there's a lot coming in i want to try and get them all answered if possible Right, so John, a question for you for, from O'Reilly Aubrey. John, when estimating carbon sequestration from trees, do you deduct the biomass taken out when trimming hedgerows or cutting down trees? When you create a carbon balance sheet, if you remove, if you cut a tree down and you remove it, that is a removal and you, in a balance sheet, you need to account for that. That's a negative. But then if you use that, uh, that tree to fuel a biomass boiler that displaces fossil fuels, that's a positive. So you can actually leverage, you know, if, if you currently heat your milk parlor using brown energy and you displace that using a biomass boiler from trees, okay, it's a negative when you cut the tree down, but it's a positive if you reuse the tree and you actually displace fossil fuels coming onto your farm. So you can actually leverage your carbon neutrality or accelerate your carbon neutrality position. Right, from, from Ian Buchanan, and this is for John. What methods does John use to spread his slurry and what way are the cattle housed on the farm? So at the moment, all our slurry is put on by trailing shoe and uh, all our slurry is also, we biologically treat our slurry with a biological additive to actually reduce the ammonia content of that. Currently, we don't have any animals on the farm. Because of the heritage status, we were not allowed to put farm buildings on it. So it's a grazing farm. Our animals are finished off, and the slurry that we get, we actually get our neighbor slurry because he's an intensive dairy farm, and we do a deal with that. Because we are very keen to put slurry back on. Again, the work that's going on in Hillsborough is showing that cattle slurry is very good to accelerate carbon sequestration in soils. Another one for you, how much lime have you put on? So initially we went on, in 2014 we did five ton per hectare or two ton per acre over the whole farm. Two years later we came back and we, because all our soil analysis is GPS, we actually managed, we have a contractor who has a variable rate lime spreader. So when we went on two years later, our application rate was a variable rate. And so some of it got as low as one ton per hectare and some of it went as high as six ton per hectare. And really what we're trying to do is uniform the farm up at a pH of 6.5 or higher. That's our, that's our aim at the moment. Last spring, we just touched up on a few bits. Again, no more than two, two tons the acre on about a quarter of the farm that hadn't, you know, we had some fields down at 4.9. So we had a long way for that to travel. And we're a great believer in lime, a little bit often, rather than huge, big, heavy doses. And the GPS technology is fantastic. Being able to put the lime on where it's needed and not put it on where it's not needed is fantastic. A question for, for John again. If you're planting 400 trees per hectare, what grass yield do you get? So far, we get no difference. In the trials that were in Loch Gaul, they had no reduction in grass yield in the first 12 years. Our, what we're going to do in and, and year 10 to year 12 is we're going to either pollard or coppice our trees and manage the trees so that there will be no negative impact on grass yield. Because that's what silver pasture is about. Agroforestry, you'll take a reduction in grass yield to optimize your timber. In our case, 
we're going to keep our grass yields optimal and we're going to manage the trees not to take, not to shade the grass. For you again, John, have you done any measurements of water infiltration in diverse swards of silver pasture? Not in silver pasture, but we have done it in our multi-species swards. And actually, there's quite a lot of published data. Christine Marley, uh, Christina Marley in Ibers and Aberystwyth, she did a lot of work on water infiltration rate using legumes. And certainly she saw up to 12 times better infiltration in swords, particularly with red clover. White clover is also good, but red clover has the edge on it. Uh, we have not done it in our farm in silver pasture, but I believe AFPI have done it, and that played into their, their calculations of a 17-week greater window of trafficability in a year. They measure soil moisture and the straight grass and within silk pasture. And that's how they're working out the increased trafficability for 17 weeks a year. Next one is, hi John, is it possible to put standard carbon values on inputs, outputs to assist farmers in their journey towards carbon neutrality? The answer is yes, but I think that actually misses the point because what we're trying to do here is empower farmers with knowledge about how they improve their own system. And actually, I'm quite competitive. I'm not happy just with standard figures. I want the right figures for my farm. I get measured on my farm. I don't get measured on my neighbor's farm or the person down the road. So we are very keen to be more sorts so that when, when we you know, put in a multi-species sward rather than ryegrass, if we're going to increase segregation, I want that in my balance sheet. I want acknowledgement that I have done positive change. And when there's a value on that, I want to optimize my return on carbon, as well as the sales we get from meat. And um, from Rachel, you've gathered a truly impressive level of detail about the farm's carbon stocks, usage and sequestration. But I'm just wondering how much was invested in gathering this data and is this something that would be viable for most farms? Also, what are the next steps for the industry to establish a standardized means of calculation robust enough to stand up to scrutiny from retailers and international buyers as we often hear carbon figures debated? So when we started this journey, I was told it couldn't be done, okay? So we are an innovation company, so we were determined to prove people wrong that we were going to do it. We were going to use good science, good scientific partners, and produce the data and be transparent in our journey. I hope I've shared that with you. It costs us quite a lot of money to do it. For example, the LIDAR cost us 30 pounds a hectare to do. And although, because we were first in it and Chagas were very keen to support us, they did the analysis of our LIDAR free of charge. But if I was to buy that service, it probably would cost me another 30 pounds an acre, hectare, sorry. So, you know, the LIDAR analysis, the LIDAR survey, LIDAR analysis is expensive. It's our belief that as this becomes more routine, the cost of LIDAR will plummet. We will also get more private sector people out there who will actually do the analysis for a lot cheaper. So when you're starting on a journey, expect a high cost. We did have a high cost but we think it's really doable. In regards to our precision soil sampling analysis, we have an independent private sector contractor comes in with his quad bike and he does our 91 hectares and he charges me for sampling and analysis 3,100 pounds. And you know, I think that's really good value for money. He's doing it with precision, he's doing it with GPS, I'm getting good data and I get it every two years. I actually think getting data is cheap because the quality of the decisions I'm making with that visibility of where my farm is, we're making far better quality decisions and we've dramatically improved grass utilization. We started our journey at four ton per hectare. Uh, I was hearing from the team today that we're hitting 12 ton per hectare in some of our land. And that's a journey of six years. We've gone from four ton per hectare utilized to 12 ton per hectare utilized over six years. That is a dramatic turnaround. This is the last question. It's for all three speakers. I'll ask John, James first, then Sam, and then John. 
And the question is from Ryan McGuire, what key on-farm mitigation strategies should farmers prioritise to minimise emissions and reduce your footprint? Feeding incentives, slurry management, question marks. Basically, what, what way that we try and tackle it is just by maximising our efficiency. So it's all those little things, really. If you can rear more more calves, if you can increase your grassland utilisation, I, I think, you know, what John said about multi-species swords I, th I think that's a massive thing I, li I listened to a talk the other day by Christine Jones and she was saying that the majority of carbon in our soil is, is built from what is under the ground you know that was news to me I, I assumed that it was biomass above the ground people you know doing chopping straw and a lot of that but actually it's, it's root exudates which is probably increasing the carbon more than anything so I don't know if that's answered the question, but yeah, that's that's the way we're looking at it. Probably just through better grass and management as much as anything. Sam, have you got any comments on that? Yeah, I, I would agree with James. Uh, Previous efficiencies, I'm very focused on genetics and animal and animal performance. That we're trying to build our organic matter more and more every every year here, and um, soil health and um, produce more grass, secret trace more carbon. I think that's I think that's the answer. And John, any further developments or comments on that, please? I mean, I, I think what everyone's getting, there is a cocktail of solutions out there. One thing for certain is there's no silver bullet. So you go into your toolbox of solutions, and there'll be two or three solutions that will suit your farm. Certainly for me, you still need to drive efficiency. Average daily weight, live, live weight gain, fundamental. Day, days to slaughter, fundamental. Then going along, I mean, what we've done in the multi-species score, so we've dropped our nitrogen application from 170 kilos per hectare down to 70, and next year we're going to push it even lower. You know, those kind of efficiencies, reducing nitrous oxide emissions, that is stunning. Remember, nitrous oxide is worse than methane. Methane's 27 times more global warming. Nitrous oxide's 296 times, and rarely nitrous oxide is talked about. So switching from chemical nitrogen to biological nitrogen legumes we think it's a huge win to reduce nitrous oxide emissions. I'd like to now hand over to Pref Professor Nigel Scotland, who'll just do a bit of a summary and a wrap up. Thank you very much, James, and good evening to everybody. I'm actually going to draw your attention, first of all, to the results of the poll that's uh, on screen at present, and particular to question three. Do you feel consumers will increasingly respond to foods of lower carbon when purchasing and a resounding yes to that. And I think that's a very important point to keep our focus on uh, of the importance of uh, this evening's discussion. The consumer and society is getting more and more interested in the big area of, of climate change. This is a key driver as we go forward and it's evidenced in tonight's discussions. It's also, if you look at the other questions, the, the survey responses there, you, you will see that the majority of you by far on this webinar tonight have a big interest and sustained interest in, in, in carbon on your farm and learning more about how to address the issue. So tonight's webinar has provided some excellent insight uh, to that. Our two farmers, Sam and James, emphasized a number of very practical approaches to driving on-farm efficiency, from breeding to health plans to multi-species wards to hedgerows, locking up carbon in your farm. And John has provided us with a very in-depth, excellent discussion of a ruminant performance agricultural platform. And I really feel that this is very much state of the art, really tackling one of the biggest questions today in ruminant agriculture, the whole situation of the carbon and the environmental impact of ruminant agriculture. John emphasized to us the importance of not simply looking at gross emissions, which is how our industry is reported on today, but actually looking at net emissions, which of course, as you now can see from tonight's discussion, is the balance between gross emissions and carbon that can be sequestered 
on your farm, for example, in the soil, in the hedgerows, in the trees, and so on. So net carbon balance is a big take-home message for me tonight. And it was a very elegant description and journey by John to walk us through the principles of how one can establish a net farm carbon balance. It is also very interesting that John opened up the subject of water quality. We touched on this at our webinar two weeks ago. I'd just like to add a brief message that this is also a very important angle for us to consider in our farming systems. And finally, just to conclude the, the message from John, uh, measuring and reporting and quality data. I think in all of the webinars that we've had in this series over the last number of weeks, we get the word quality and we get data and we get measuring. If we cannot measure things, we cannot change, but we need quality measurements to be able to get quality data to make quality decisions. And the final thing I would add in here is just to remember that in reducing your carbon footprint, generally you're driving improvements in productivity, improvements in efficiency, and that delivers very significant economic benefits as well. So going forward, we're going to be working into a marketplace with consumers, creating the pool for foods of lower carbon footprint, but equally, we will continue to employ technologies to improve efficiency, which will also deliver economic benefits. It's what we call a win-win, and we all need win-wins. So with that, I'd like to thank you all very much for participating and highlight to you that our next webinar will be in two weeks' time, two weeks tonight, when we're going to move on and address what is also one of the big challenges in, in agriculture today, the area of One Health and farm animal welfare. And for that evening, uh, our farmers, uh, Sam and James, are going to be joined by Professor Eric Morgan, and Dr. Gareth Arnott of the Institute for Global Food Security at Queen's University in Belfast. And I look forward to connecting with you all on the Monday, the 5th of October at eight o'clock. Our final event will be on the 19th of October, where we'll be, we'll be focusing in on aspects of eating quality of beef. And the speaker that night will be myself. So with that, I shall leave it and thank all our speakers and most of all, thank you all for participating in this webinar tonight. Thank you very much.